Okay, well, yeah, I'm Florian there, showing this red hair. Um, I take care of some of Federal's documentation, uh, for example, the new star guide. So you just see me plus one there, is uh, one of my creations. Otherwise, um, yeah, I've done, I've worked in open source documentation for the last six, eight ish years. And then documentation all together on public cloud. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about writing for translation or how to avoid ambiguity. No ambiguity, no worries. Uh, writing is a very easy task. Everybody does it every day, uh, shopping lists and whatever. However, writing in a way that the translator doesn't get a headache is a very challenging task. Um, why is it so challenging? Uh, we're going to talk, talk about translation tools and how to control language. Uh, translation tools, some of you already got a few ideas, but before that, let's have a look what is the real problem for translators or for localization is exactly that. We have one manual and at least 23 translations. Localize in to many languages, I think uh, GNOME has 127 localization teams listed. Not all of them are active, but most of them. So you can cite fairly around 90, 99 uh, languages. Uh, each of your now files gets translated into. Uh, Fedora, does anybody have an idea about the fantastic uh, operating system Fedora? How many languages do we localize it to? 22. 22. No. Very good. Okay. Yeah. That's right? No. Uh, All of them. <laughs> I was like, really? Uh, 84. Okay. Let me help you. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's about 23. Why? Because it is a huge effort to do this. And actually, we have 40 icon sliders in Brisbane, uh, and only 42 tech writers. So you see, the effort is far mm. higher than that. Um, any questions about those details? Hopefully not. Do do you, does Fedora get mm. the 23 languages for free, kind of? We usually, as long as it is compatible with Fedora, because Red Hat is not always compatible with Fedora, okay. uh, translators can make use of um, 
Red Hat Transfer criteria. But uh, at some reason point, uh, Fedora has many guides, uh, Red Hat doesn't, okay. and vice versa. And you really want to have people working on it. And um, many former translators, for example, nowadays um, develop this themselves. Like if you go to Vladik in Europe, for example, you meet a lot of former translators who now contribute to the source code. They saw a first student. Yeah, for example, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so you find that translation is a, a sort of a gateway, gateway drug to, for other yeah. kinds of contributions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gave it to the hard work. So, uh, you can suck up people into part first offering something simple. And uh, students don't know how much they're really know. Like they're really brave people in translation teams, but they, they are also really, really surprised. Like a very good friend of mine, Gabo from Hungary, uh, he's a translator, but uh, he also fixed my two laptops when he was there for a visit for two hours and uh, explained me major problems we had in one of our tools. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the password, so he couldn't fix it himself. Uh, yes, translators are fantastic. And the more you translate, the more you understand about the system. So I find it's a pretty excellent way of getting into it. Um, can we move on? I, I have no question. There's 23 translations, are there is? OK, Red Hat has 23. Right. Uh, why? It's very clear because if you have to apply for it, it's a huge okay. problem. That was my question. However, why, why do we have that here? many? 23 is still a lot, right? Why do we have that many? Uh, basically, uh, for the European Union, the European Union has a standard of, I think, six languages. They require, otherwise you don't get a European license for the operating system. And India requires, I think, 11 local languages. Sure. And you already have 17, plus uh, Japanese, a couple of Asian languages you throw in, and you're there with 23. I think 23 is pretty much the standard um, canonical, probably has the same problem. I've heard that's uh, what Dell has, yeah. yeah. Like 22 or 23 is like, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think the 23 is a magical number everybody has to. And that's a pain in the back side. Is that? Oh, no? I think it started. No, first. no, no, you go, please. I, I would just ask you, I just wanted to uh, have you repeat what was the 11 for, the 11 languages? You said six was? India. 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 Oh, okay. India. Please okay. don't ask me about, I know Tamil is an Indian language. In oh, I just didn't hear what you said. Basically, okay. and then Hindi, of course, but uh, I'm not an expert in Sanskrit languages, so. So, if, I have actually have two questions. If you, if they may be part of your presentation, so if they are, just shut me up. One is, so the 22, 23 languages, uh, is that, I would expect that actually, um, that doesn't necessarily cover a lot of the developing world. I think you probably it does, probably doesn't cover the developing world, like parts of Africa or. Well, Africa. African languages, uh, it doesn't cover. Okay. What it covers are lingua francas. Lingua franca is a language that reaches more people, right. like English and French, and right. Portuguese, so that helps. Right. Um, African languages itself are not even really taught in computer science classes in Africa. So that's an easy way. As sure. soon as you start studying computer sciences in Africa, you usually you have English. English. So that is why most French speakers, African French speakers, uh, also have excellent English right. because they have studied English. So French would be a good language. To, if, French is a very if, necessary language. If you're going to, language. if you're going to try to get the right, hit, if you're going to try to hit the the big ones, right, and really put a lot of effort behind yeah. uh, a set of languages to just translate your docs into. Well, lingua francas are three languages nowadays. Uh, English, of course, uh, French, and Portuguese. And if you have those three, you're fine. Um, that's basics. Um, for India, technically, you need Hindi, which is a lingua franca, alongside uh, English in India. But the government nowadays requires uh, that 
images. So for the bigger reason. And I, I guess uh, translating for five million people, like for example Bulgarian, doesn't make much sense, but translating for 80 million people using Tamil, uh, it would be a sin not to do that. Okay. And do you guys pay, pay okay, so you, so you said Red Hat pays for the translations, Red and Hat. I take it that uh, Fedora does not, or? Well, Fedora is a community-based project, like, um, like known like uh, Debian. Sure. Like uh, many others. So we have only volunteers. Some of these volunteers get a paycheck from Red Hat, but only because I do most of my work inside Red Hat, and on top of it, I do all the Laura. So, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the few people who get paid for my Fedora work, but that's not way for me. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm ready to do I I don't know. <laughs> like I'm getting stiff here. Any more questions? Or? Let's have a look at what challenges actually translators face. <laughs> candlestick? Candlestick? Yeah, very good question. Candlesticks are white, right? Oh. No, candlestick. Or maybe faces? Candlestick is white. Which rhymes actually, I find that very funny. No, ambiguity. I see the one foot. <laughs> never My ex-wife told me she never knows whether I'm laughing or smiling or whining. And, uh, <laughs> Did you say ex-wife? Ex-wife, oh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she didn't know what you meant. <laughs> Out of politeness, I'm not talking about others. <laughs> so, wow. Well, the biggest problem is ambiguity, which happens due to missing information, due to inconsistent terminology, Due to nominalization, that means uh, you use uh, a verb for a noun and you already know, don't know whether it is a verb or a noun or an adjective or whatever. So, uh, and due to complex sentences. <coughs> Later on, I will show you a fantastic example of a. With nominalization, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Nominalization is um, when you turn a verb into a noun. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah. Pit my ride. Sorry, you didn't catch it? Tint my ride. It's a really horrible yeah. word. Yeah. And it's that would be possible. <laughs> if you want to, I hold people down and usually just slap them, okay? Yeah. So, how can we overcome this very easy task? Never works. Provide background information. This is for the writer as much as for the developer. Uh, like for example, if you write your strings for, for the user interface, I think uh, GNOME as well has the uh, possibility to enter some background information, so right away. And so the more yeah. information the translator actually has, the more context he or she has. They just know what they're doing mm -hmm. about. And translating blind strings, for example, like 15 years ago I was asked to translate from German or French into English, some really strange strings. Turned out it was actually for the, for the Israeli army, which was fine. But uh, I didn't have any context. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know who I was working for. And I just had this project. And the strings were totally out of context. And uh, of course, I could go back and fix them once I knew what it was for that. So that was terrible. Background information was missing. Uh, limit the versions you provide. It's very, very important thing. Uh, the more versions you provide, the more angry the translator gets because they start over and over and over again. Even if they have a translation tool, it is very, very painful. So, so when you say limit the versions you provide, do you mean only translate for certain yeah. releases or something? Or? No. But uh, the typical thing with Tech Writer is finish this project just sends it off very quickly to the translator because you only have two days for release. And then your boss says, oh no, we need to change this. Developer calls you and says, oh sorry, totally forgot, um, 
when I reviewed your text, um, six chapters should be added, <laughs> um, which might be possible, but uh, not for the translator, because so, uh, again, once he starts, he starts. And that's the software release cycle world, this is don't break string freeze. Yeah. It's called what? Don't break string freeze. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. <laughs> so, uh, another very important one is more culturally specific expressions. Never write bloody hell. That's the one you want to avoid jargon, but also technical jargon. Like, um, my favorite is um, app. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, install the app. What, the ape? <laughs> or monkey? Or what kind of applications? Ones I have on my phone? Yeah, you have to be more precise, so please avoid technical jargon and call horse and rider <coughs> here. Uh, also try to avoid acronyms and, yeah. Um, a question about the culturally specific expression one. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever read the Head First programming books, but one of the big things they have for documentation for people learning a new programming language is they talk about neuroscience and what it takes to make the brain see the tutorial as interesting. And so they do some like funny things and, and clever phrases and stuff in it. And is this something that one should avoid completely when writing for translation? Or should one do things like explain the joke or make it so that understanding it is not essential to understanding the actual documentation. Like, okay, you thread two things together here. One is books that introduce a certain tool, like um, my favorite is uh, Car Fixing for Dummies. Like, I, I actually really need this book. But <laughs> um, this is not an instructional book. This is a book that describes a certain thing in a very entertaining language for native speakers. And that's the reason why you actually buy it in the States and not in the Czech Republic. Um, if you want to read a guide or instructional manual, you do not enter any kind of humor, you do not put any kind of jargon, any kind of lingo in it, and you do not write cool. Ah, well, that is very important because you want to be very factual here. You don't want any misunderstandings. Like this, I love those books the series uh, for dummies, wow. uh, and they're very colloquial, they're very easy going and uh, lots of fun, but it's not exactly what you want in manuals. About the jargon and acronyms, um, I was actually thinking about this the other day, and uh, if, if the jargon or the acronym is well accepted and has like really a lot of currency within a particular field, I think it's often better to use it, uh, because you get a more specific meaning by using the jargon word than by using like the general words that might describe the jargon word. Because right. like there's often like some some slight overloading or some more detail that's understood when you use that jargon word. Like DNS? For or example. Acronym. Yeah. Well, like, if you have acronyms. I could say like a name lookup system or something like that. But right. if you have acronyms, we usually have to go on the rules that the first time we have the acronym we put the full name and the acronym in brackets and now the W use right? uh, the bracketed acronym all the time. But, but first you need to introduce it. But first say app, for example, right? I think of that as like uh, something that I can get from like an add-on to my operating system. It means a little bit more to me than application. Like I don't know how to translate app into Hungarian or Croatian. Right. Like, uh, Apps is a term that I've been dealing with a lot lately. And a lot of languages don't, don't allow that kind of shortening. So application translates as application and app translates as application. There is no shortened option. Yeah. So. The problem is later on I will show you a couple of screenshots of translation tools, how they have to deal with that. And that becomes very obvious why we don't want to have two words for the same meaning. You get into really deep waters as a translator if you have applications and apps. And you probably use application in another context than an app. And there you go. Well, that's a similar example, I guess, we saw in an Esperanto translation was that preferences and settings 
was translated to the same word, and like you had you had settings oh. inside the preferences menu. And this was an <laughs> argument, like with the I I had like I sent him screenshots, and the thing I was trying to show him that in every language there's two different words, and then and then I'm like, okay, he's German. Let me pull up the German one. And the German one did the same thing, and I'm like, okay, I, I don't even, I can't even prove my point. <laughs> I just hear your silly head on that. The sure. reason I was asking about that is because I'm working on the developer documentation for GNOME, and some of it has to be technical reference where you just need to look up how to implement a specific widget, but some of it is a guide where I'm actually trying to teach people, and. I'm kind of balancing what I understand about writing clear and simple things that can be easily translated and what I know about neuroscience and writing things that the human brain finds interesting and it's a bit of a challenge. Well, I find neuroscience is very interesting. Uh, I study psychology myself, but uh, I don't think in a tutorial about computer science or about knowing in general, you should not venture out to other areas, don't confuse, be very straight about, that's it, okay. I just kind of want to add to, to this okay. conversation basically. Uh, so the head first uh, series of books I think is general, that, that, that she's referred to is generally written not for translation. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's very, I, I, I'm very familiar with, with the format and love it myself. Uh, and with the, the tutorials that are, that are being written, um, we have like sample codes and then we have tutorials and I think yeah. They're only mainly going to be translated into, I, I believe, Spanish. I think most people who are trying to access these tutorials will be like programming, like English speakers, even if they're from foreign countries. So I think I think you can. I personally feel that you could delve I, a little I bit. I wouldn't count on that. <laughs> no, no way. Like technically, you can translate. always find an excuse why not to. And I think tutorials are very very important. They have to be well written, maybe. It has to be a more literate translation than uh, yeah. what we usually do. But that requires another kind of translator. It doesn't require a volunteer who likes computers and yeah. just got his first laptop from mommy and now he really wants to learn about now. Well, I kind of see it. I kind of feel like maybe the Easter egg approach is a way to take it in that if they understand or if they want to provide context or something that adds to their experience, but if they don't understand a particular reference to something, it doesn't take away or make them stumble. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether this makes sense to discuss this any longer. For me, if you want to internationalize or localize into one language, you have to be very unambiguous, you have to be very clear, you have to avoid cultural references, you have to avoid humor. And it's very hard to write this actually. To be <coughs> friendly, to be understandable without humor, it's very hard to do that. And it's not very interesting writing it either. That's <laughs> um, true, that is true. It's cool, but, um, but that's life is short. Yeah. I mean, that that's ex exactly. A parting thought on the topic, maybe? Please. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in, in writing a library like Hewlett, uh, you have to wonder what the API should look like. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that an API uh, that's good to use from language linkers um, to put into something like Python or JavaScript, uh, it has to be very precise and like using well defined idioms all the time. Um, and doing this, tends to make an API that's not so fun to use from C. So we're often having the case where we make like the findable API, but then also like the C convenience API. And it's two different consumables. Uh, and it's really similar to this. I mean, the thing that you would want to give to translators is this very you know, proper along the proper lines. And then the thing that you would want to give to the person who's actually consuming it directly in English is a different consumable. Uh, and perhaps the problem is that we're trying to target both of those audiences yeah. with the same document. And it's almost like we should have like the proper, you know, done properly English document and almost get somebody to translate that into like more casual English and have that be a separate. Uh, isn't that yeah. the difference between a tutorial and a reference? Mm. 
No, there's far more fundamental differences. Like a reference is like, you know, I already know how to use this thing, but I forget some details, so I need to go in. A tutorial is like, what is this? Tell me about it. Like they're they're worlds apart. Right, that, and that's that's what I mean. Is uh, a tutorial is to introduce you. That's the place that you can uh, use local humor and that type of thing. Whereas a reference, you want the bare dry facts in as with no embellishment. Well, I think even within, okay, so reference documentation is probably always going to be dry. But speaking of tutorials, it's possible to have a dry tutorial and a lively tutorial. Uh, so and I think having like a dry tutorial written originally in English and then somebody comes along to make it more interesting, but then the translators operate from the original document could be, I, 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 we're probably never going to do that because we barely have enough people to write the English one. It would be fantastic, probably. I don't know whether it would apply. Because we have a lot of non native speakers using it. Okay. Why don't we let Florian move on and we can come back and yeah. talk yeah, about just, this stuff. Just all one thought on yours. Um, you have most of your English texts are not read by native speakers, but by non native speakers. That is a very, very important thing. That is, even if you would not localize, you still have to be very clear and you have, really have to avoid all these points because most of the world does not speak English as a first language. And we don't know much about the level of English that a certain user speaks. Uh, for example, in Japanese, Japan, uh, many people who leave, uh, we are selling uh, Viagra when we send out a rather text Whoa. and because um, uh, the English is not good enough they can read certain keywords and that's it but as longer the text is and the more chatty the text is the less information they can gather from it that's a pretty good point yeah so you really have to be too tutorials are really a different thing like who are you writing tutorials for if you're writing that for American school kids in science uh, competitions, yes, it has to be chatty because otherwise they'll fall asleep. Yeah, but um, then you have the ability to translate the tutorials. But in, in Gnome, you don't really write for science contests, you write for people who are a bit more serious about it, so you don't really need to keep them awake. If we're doing that, though, then doesn't that limit the size of the audience? There's a very specific demographic that seems to be dominant in free software communities, and it seems to be the one that's very intrinsically motivated to do hard technical things without any sort of prompting or encouragement. Wow, so you don't need tutorials. <laughs> <laughs> That was mean, of course you do. Uh, the question is how you draft them. And I believe that simpler the language the better it is. Um, if you're interested in more expressive stuff, then I, I believe uh, very good instruction from O'Reilly, for example, are chatty. And they should be chatty because uh, this is a different level. And that's fine. Tiffany. A very quick question. How much leeway does a translator have to be more of an interpreter as opposed to a translator? Well, to, uh, to basically take out the, in the translation colloquial sciences, and, yeah. we talk about recreation, not translation. Okay. So, for example, I translate other stuff. Uh, I already said that I'm interested in psychology. Uh, I translate uh, Frankfurt School of Psychologists. I cannot translate sentence by sentence, word by word, but I really have to recreate that. Mm -hmm. The text that, that is uh, why I got the <coughs> job, because uh, I understand the topic. And uh, the same applies at least to, to a certain level to our volunteers translating in their bedrooms. They need to understand what they are doing. And they can only understand if they have enough information, if they have uh, only one or two versions if they have uh, no culturally specific expressions because uh, they might not understand it either or they might misunderstand it. Um, in Prague I, I got into a street brawl a couple of years ago because the chap spoke 
in English to me, but he didn't understand the word guy. He thought I told him he's gay. <laughs> and uh, that was rather painful because he was two heads higher than, taller than me, so that was no good. <laughs> How long did you expect to spend on this slide? <laughs> uh, I thought 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ryan, for saving me. Okay. And now we are almost finished, Ryan. Let's talk about cat. Not the cat, but computer assisted translation. Most of you probably have heard about it. Um, anybody knows any open source cat tools? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this include like translation memory or? Ah, here we go, for example. Translation memory is one of the most important parts of um, CAT tools. Okay, for example, here we go. G Translator, guess what? G Translator is a known tool. What do those translation tools do? They first recognize the uh, source text, match it to already translated source text and match it with the right target text. This is called segmenting. It breaks up the text sentence by sentence or even smaller. I did that on purpose. It was really grinding one so you, could, you stop reading it. Uh, it just makes me really slower. I'm not sure better glasses than me. I didn't do that. So here you see very clearly actually this user interface is already localized and checked. You have here the original text, here you have the target text, and now it goes through checking whether this already exists. So this is something we call pre-translating, going through and checking whether we already have the string translated, or whether we have a fuzzy match. A fuzzy match is something that is very similar, like for example, one word is different, um, could uh, please enter A, B, C, and we need please enter A, B, C, D. So in this case, it will be a fuzzy match with a high percentage. My favorite translation tool from back in the 90s is uh, something called WordFast, which nowadays is also, was actually one of the first Ah, free, not exactly open source tool. Uh, nowadays, it's unfortunately also proprietary and open source. It's a weird mixture. But here you can very easily see, here we have the source text, and in green, we have some new text translator row. But in yellow, you have something, can you see that? 88, 88% match, and here, um, the tool suggests the translation I have done before, or somebody has done before, so I have a fuzzy match here. Let's have a look at another tool, which I have actually gotten rid of. Um, <coughs> normal way of doing it is first uh, you have your PO files, um, you first pre translate, that means you go through. Uh, through with your tool and check, you segment all sentences and check uh, what has been translated. Um, those will be green. Uh, fuzzy matches, you decide uh, at a certain percentage you probably want to rewrite the whole sentence and say like, if it is 5% fuzzy match, it's a waste of time. You tell the machine, please uh, do not pre translate anything that is less than 55% of a fuzzy match. After that, you go through sentence by sentence, and you, in your translation memory, pre-translates, and after that, you go sentence by sentence through, and translate what is not translated yet. Okay. Are you familiar with Vertal? I hear about it, yeah. Is it similar to WordPress? Because it's, it, it's supposed to be similar to that. Like, I haven't seen it in, in person yet, so it's supposed to be. Okay. Can we go on or? Yes, we can. So, what do cat tools do? Now I repeat myself because I forgot I have the slide here. Uh, they segment the text into sentences or chunks, build a translation memory 
from the segmented chunks match identical and similar chunks to translation memory, pre translate, and here we go. I don't have trouble translating the last sentence of this slide. Mark? Yeah, the spelling error, but that's okay. No, no, Mark is yeah. a particular. That's jargon? No, it's a, it's a substitution. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of translation. How is this? so bloody embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just pretend we have grammar. Another tool, escape Bible. Here you nicely see what happens. You have the sentence here. You have a fuzzy match. Here and now you can actually rewrite it yourself. And. That was a cap tool. What about any questions? like trans effects or something? Does that have any features? Or trans effects is manages the whole thing. Fuzz effects uh, does not really have uh, the ability to segment, I think. Oh. I have to be careful here. But now, uh, in Fedora, they use their own tools. For example, G Translator. Uh, Peta uses k level, I think, or used to run k level. It went to a Rosetta. Yeah. Which is a very nice tool, too. But it did. Well, well, okay. I, I was just going to say that it tends to encourage inconsistent translations. If you don't have a very consistent uh, memory, it doesn't help you. If you well, don't and that and the fact that it, it sort of, it's kind of crowdsourcing the translations from lots of different and it's just like, you know, one person will translate it one way to another, another way, and they get stuck in the same application. Uh, one important thing is you have a whitelist and blacklist as a translator. Like a whitelist is the words you want to use, and a blacklist contains a list of uh, words you do not want to use. For example, the formal rule is do not use more than one word for the same meaning. So you can blacklist certain other meanings. And so even as a translator, you already know that uh, the writer used two terms for the same word. You can actually already have that in your blacklist, the second word, and always when you run the shell script, you check and see, voila, he has actually wanted to say the same as the other word. Here we go, and you can translate. Uh, the writer might not want to use two words for the same meaning, and that is how Okay, let's talk. What we can do as tag writers to help translate it. Good. It's not very easy to do that. One is controlled languages. Controlled languages is a rather old concept um, that was really hot in the 70s with Caterpillar. For example. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he's referring to. No, well, free Esperanto course. No, Esperanto is not a controlled language, but a very good idea. Uh, it's not a natural language. Okay. Well, I let me use my ideas. Okay, let me get back to <laughs> controlled languages. Uh, in the 70s, first controlled language was uh, Caterpillar controlled language. Uh, Caterpillar, everybody knows they make these huge trucks and baggers and whatever, big huge machines like Canadians should know about it, right? Yeah, they were in the news recently. Yeah. What? And, um, they laid off a bunch of people. Yeah. Um, so in the 70s they tried to have a language that is very unambiguous because um, if you have a big machine you've got to pull your hand out out before you start the motor again, you might not have the hand. And that happened a couple of times. So they decided, what can we do here? Um, we will have a very controlled, very restricted language, or very restricted English way of saying things. And so uh, that was one. Now we have the most known is probably ASD, STE 100, which is a standard or simplified technical English for normal users. Uh, on top of that, we have something called basic English, global English control language optimi optimized for uniform translation or cloud. Uh, and I think 10 others. <laughs> and uh, it's a great thing with 10. 
<laughs> and usually takes a, takes a tech provider four to five months to be trained in one of those. Um, try to tell that you open source project. The project manager will probably kiss you <laughs> or strangle you, whatever. It's not a good idea. <coughs> but how does this work? Why do we do this? Machine translation. It enables machine translation. And it's the only way, if you, if you have a very restrictive uh, language input, it's the only way at the moment to do machine translations. Are you just pretending to write Ryan? Yes. <laughs> He's writing code. No, oh, okay. <laughs> just looks like you're pretending. You're paying attention to the. Wow. Well, that's really that fits my ears. Okay. <laughs> so it enables machine translation. Machine translation you guys know about. Or should I talk in more detail what that actually means? Talk more about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, machine translation is the idea that um, you have computer translate. And again, the computer takes sentence by sentence or segments all those chunks. Uh, checks with translation memory and with certain dictionaries can actually segment even words and puts it in the same same way as it was in the original text, only translated. Works in a very, very limited way because uh, of the way we write. We are very expressive, we use very colloquial language and uh, we change uh, cases, we use more than two timelines we're talking about past, simple past, present past, and whatever, uh, which machine translation can't handle. So only a very restrictive controlled language input allows for machine translation. The other one is the translation memory. Brian already said something about it. Uh, it allows for a very high pre-translation and fuzzy match rate. Pre-translation we already talked about, that means uh, all those sentences that have already been translated before are now in the translation memory and the translation memory pulls those out again. Fuzzy match is exactly the same. Uh, it is believed that the readability is improved because the text is more uniform. Uh, you can also use uh, pre-approved terminology which is probably a good idea. <laughs> now, as I said, okay. As I said, uh, it needs extensive training providers. Um, at the moment, everything is proprietary software. And before I said, uniform text might be easy to read. Uniformity usually puts you off reading something. So it's a pro and a con. And uh, have you ever sat on a sit on a committee approving <laughs> terminology? <laughs> like if nobody hands out speed or anything, it's going to be deadly. So <laughs> Do they have like software that you can run on the text that will like tell you that you're like, out of control? Yeah. Oh yeah. Run? Like it's a proprietary software that checks your terminology, for example. Like I was talking earlier about blacklists and whitelists. We can do, like if you use Linux, for example, you can use your shell script um, to check whether you're using a lot or approved language or terminology. And, um, but I mean, like, even above that, is it yes. is the controlled language at such a point that the, the grammar is so constrained that if the machine doesn't understand your grammar, it thinks there's a problem? Or? No, that's exactly where the extensive planning comes in. The grammar is something you have to read it for yourself and you have to try, be trained and get used to it. Uh, I remember from um, back in uh, my Windows days, uh, Word used to have, or I guess it still does, uh, have some function where you could run run your script on it and or and it would tell you the, the grade, <coughs> grade level reading, like the reading grade oh, level yeah. of your text. And it was quite um, interesting because um, in one of my engineering classes, we had to do this. We were expected to write a report um, at the 
no more than ninth grade reading level. Um, and he showed an example of some like old style English text that was like really impossible to read. It was it was written at like the grade reading level of like the twenty seventh grade. So it was like and but the the couple of key things that I got out of that little lesson was that um, the shorter the sentences, uh, the easier the, the reading level instead of having lots of commas and run on sentences because then each idea mm. is separate. And I think for translation that would also be easy easier if you have uh, shorter sentences because it's breaking things up too and uh, and length of words and I don't know, that's like the only experience like that I've had with this. This is a standard like tool for most proprietary software because uh, they're using different level words. They even have levels for their terminology, like for example if you write end user documentation, you have a certain level where you use a certain kind of terminology. If you have engineers, you use a different type of terminology that is less explanatory and more direct. So you have different levels. And this software is actually able to check the terminology according to level. Um, like I read documents talking about changing the level of language. You apparently can do that really basically by hitting a button and that's it. But that's cool and it's fantastic. It is hideous to work with this. And uh, like I would not want to do that on my own free will. If somebody pays me, I might, might be able to do it. I have the training, but it is painful. And asking volunteers to do that is usually Trying to write to a reading level? Trying to write to a. Is that what is painful? Like trying to write to that reading level? Or? No, writing in controlled language for oh. stop is, is painful. It's okay. very uninteresting. It doesn't really make you feel happy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like living in a police state on your screen. <laughs> like, uh, it's really tough. It's really tough. There are your papers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Can I can I see your terminology, please? <laughs> yeah. Okay. However, there are other ways, and I think a small toolkit might help you write in a way that translators will like you better. Uh, mine is a survival kit of ten basic rules. And yes, I want to suck up to everybody. Uh, and I do like constructive aesthetics. Well, what do we need? Action. And the active voice here. Uh, what we want to do is we want to use the active voice and the second person mark in instruction. Uh, there are two ways of saying things. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, a re review of the text is sent to you by the proofreader. Anybody written anything similar to that before? Probably. Uh, I have a, a passive voice day. <laughs> <laughs> I think passive voice day is fantastic because it really tackles the problem, problematic issue here. And I think the passive voice day should be supported in any way you can, because it really talks about one of the biggest problems. Uh, more complicated, more problematic is probably the next sentence. The computer has to be rebooted after the driver has been installed. Uh, I know, Tiffany, you speak some Polish. Can you translate that into Polish? Which one? The last one? I don't know how to say rebooted, because I'm not a technical Polish speaker, but... Well, you could oh. just... Free ten because nobody can check it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, computer musi bitch rebooted. Uh, yak driver. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a very quick look here. It takes quite a while until she gets it. Now I haven't finished. <laughs> I think that's enough. Do you want to finish? Please do. Uh, yeah. I don't know how to say husband. Uh, uh -huh. that, that tense. Because you don't have that in Polish. Can you say? Can you do that in, in Czech? Czech uh, language, I mean, ten to počítač má být. Má být. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Měl být. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the husband. Yeah. 
We're communicating. <laughs> yeah, got it. That was some kind of check upon the sheet. <laughs> okay. So, much easier, the first one is very apparent. The proofreader sends you a review of the text. Reboot the computer after you install the driver. And done. Well, those are, <coughs> mm -hmm. those are easier to read in, in English. Those are easier to understand in English as well. Yeah. As I said before, these rules also help not only non-native speakers of English when they read English, but also yourself as well. Is that correct? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is. It, it flies. Uh, after you have installed, would be. Or after you install. After you install. Okay, good, yeah. Thank you. Have even fewer tenses by. Yes, I. Installed. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. I did that <laughs> on some kind of flight to some way. Oh, it could uh, be after you install the driver. Yeah. After you install. But notice how that sentence is shorter, like going back to what I was saying about the, ninth, the, the level of, uh, that you're writing at, like that would be no more than a ninth grade reading level. Whereas yeah, but somehow people have it in their mind that they shouldn't write like this, that it's somehow better. Because of the it. English teachers, they were like, express yourself, add adjectives. Yes, please do this. <laughs> okay. Well, Don't okay. listen to your English teachers. It's almost like this is impolite. Yeah. Yeah. If well, there's something very important here, like do not express yourself, um, do say, what you really need to say and nothing else. Um, like I help myself a little bit with tricking myself into using the past tense here to enable translation here because in other languages we always need to know when things happen. Well, one thing that I found just when I translate uh, just the uh, UI strings, I find that the English PO files often have the word please. And I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> why is the computer saying please to me? Like I and I it bothers me. I, I don't want to because there are servants. <laughs> no, but it's like Polish doesn't, doesn't use much. I think just this week I well Polish doesn't use please, but even even like what I do is just Esperanto, and it's like I it hurt like I'm starting to just not put please in there because it's just it's not really doesn't belong. Well, in some cultures, this would be a little bit rudely direct, and so. Uh, you know, saying please or, or using a slightly more polite construction would be appropriate, but that's part of the translator's job is making it culturally appropriate. Mm. Well, for their culture, yeah. Right. And yeah, because that, it wouldn't fine, be culturally yeah, appropriate to put please in Polish, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. That's I, a Polish problem. That's a Polish problem. So this was very apparent and very clear. Let's go to my next golden rule, one idea, two sentence. Sounds very easy, right? Let's have a look. Then optimizing the text for comprehension, write as half of us. Can you read this for me? Wow. <laughs> it's too long, you refuse, well. Uh, and doing so allows translators and automated translation machines to create better translation results. Who hasn't fallen asleep in between? I don't even know what I just read. <laughs> yeah. Not only does it say multiple things, I think it actually says the same thing in two different ways. Uh, but can you be sure? <laughs> I wasn't done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So, what, I, what do I suggest? Oh. There's now two sentences. There we go. And when writers optimize their text for comprehension, they help the translation process. Full stop. Translation, uh, translators and automatic translation machines can achieve better results with such text. So I take both ideas, cut a sentence and a half, and have two sentences. So I have a semicolon problem where <laughs> I would actually use a semicolon there. Um, Mm -hmm. Semicolon suck, basically. I'm anti-semicolons. So semicolons are awesome, but regardless of how awesome semicolons are, are they a problem? <laughs> they are a big problem. Because uh, you use semicolon in English in another way than you use it in okay, other so languages. I see. So this is what I call ambiguity in grammar. 
try to, or punctuation, try to really mm. boil down everything to as few punctuation marks as possible. Mm. Comma and a full stop or period is all you need to express most of the things you have. Like a column, if it is on a rainy day right now, but. So would you say it's wise to just avoid semicolons if we can? Because you usually so can. Semicolons avoid definitely and be careful with punctuation. Be a minimalist with punctuation if possible. Mm. Well, the next problem is we never know what really is going on here. But we have the same meaning. We should not use different wording, but we should use the same. Uh, why is it? Instructions for installing the monitor. No, I really don't want to read anymore. Can somebody read for me, Jim. Remove the monitor from the shipping cart and the screen. Yeah, and one more. Well, how to install your keyboard, lift the keyboard from the box and discard all packaging material. It's fine. Monitor and screen yeah, is I don't the like same that. thing. That's, oh, like, okay. The screen is like the part that's inside the monitor, so maybe I should take the plastic away. <laughs> like, you know, take this part off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I would think that. <laughs> well, why, why is he using two different words if it's the same thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Box and packaging material. So what do I do here? I switch on my translation tool in my head, and I say, first of all, I give clear instructions, and uh, I remove remove the monitor from the shipping box, remove the monitor from the plastic bag. I think this is very clear. Can you go and back again? Can I go back? Oh, let me see. <laughs> um, if you wanted to and pay me a lot, you can have my slide. <laughs> <laughs> what about the free software? Like, shouldn't this be uh, available under the... I believe I saw on the front slide that it was CC Bio, so... <laughs> yeah, now I gave you light. But of course I take also... I'll buy your card. pictures. <laughs> you see. Uh, so you see, I'm using here two different bias of expressing myself which is very nice and makes the reading more interesting, but doesn't help the understanding much. Here, I always use the same sentence structure, yeah, so my translation machine will be very happy with me. And, um, I don't right. agree. The repetition it makes it harder to understand. Can you say remove the monitor from the shipping box and then remove the plastic bag? I think his point is is, is not is the specific specific? wording, but yeah, the agree. the formatting and the this is a, this Just so you can be clear, this slide is a bad example, right? Okay, this it's is a good example. example. <laughs> uh, this is the, the shipping yeah, bag really. box is different than the plastic bag, right? First, so you have the box. Inside is a monitor wrapped in, in a plastic bag. So you have to remove both. Do we agree or am I getting this wrong? No, I, I think it's fine. It's just not something that I would enjoy reading. <coughs> okay. Or writing. But as a translator, this would be much better. Well, yes, especially if you're getting paid by the word. As I said, like, the translation machine will smile at you. If you're getting paid by the word, you'd be very happy as a translator. Using pictures is another way to increase interest. Yes, pictures are really good. Pictures always help. As I said, especially for formation. Okay. Oh, well. Fair enough. Point taken. This is the, this is such a case of like totally going opposite anything you ever learned in English classes. Like there's technical English and then there's creative writing English. Because one of the things they tell you always in high school is use different words, be mm -hmm. colorful. <laughs> Don't use the same word for the same thing over and over. And then you get into technical writing and it's like forget anything your English teacher ever taught you. I Different think goals. Uh, one yeah, of my yeah. first classes in tech writing, I had a uh, very nice lady. She came in with um, some Faulkner in her hand. Fork? Faulkner. William Faulkner. Oh, Faulkner. One of you guys. 
uh, and uh, went on how beautiful Pop is and how complex and how interesting to read and just dumped him into the rubbish bin and said now let's talk about technical English because that really doesn't have anything to do with creative writing. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be creative to write technical English, that's true, but you should not write creative English. You have to be very <coughs> precise and very clear. And I would love people to use exactly this rule. This is, according to me, one of the most important ones. Do not use other sentences to, set, to express the same idea. Let's move on, because first time I'm falling asleep. <laughs> and, oh my God. I'm not reading that. <laughs> I don't think I can get anybody into oh reading <laughs> yeah, it. And actually, this is her slide, it's original. I was going to say, you would... over two sentences, uh, two pages without any periods. Well, no, in, in the original German, that would be one word, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really, but half of it, I guess. <laughs> So this is actually from a translation exercise, uh, oh, no. and this is short. You could, you could go on for longer. Uh, yeah, this is not a good idea. In Where is the one. period? At the end. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he put three at the beginning. So <laughs> ah, Ryan already <laughs> works technical English here. <laughs> translates Frank Kafka, uh, Franz Kafka into technical English. Well done. But uh, my <laughs> mindset is this. And what we said before, simple, good, complex, bad. Oh, oh translate. And I really need to hit the right button. Simple structures. Use simple sentence structures. You and your text to demonstrate that you can, if required, organize your thoughts, should use a simple sentence structure. <laughs> I love it. When you take Prozac, <laughs> if you like that, then have a psychopharmaca and more. Otherwise, you demonstrate your ability to organize your thoughts when you use a simple sentence structure. It's exactly the same idea. Only the South of Grandfather and in one very unambiguous sentence. More. <laughs> more. He wants more. Yeah. More, more. Uh, I don't know, it seems like you need some more time to do it. Okay. Aww. The next one is <laughs> things we all have little gaps in our heads and missing information. And when sentences are not complete, we don't know what's going on. Something is missing here. So, you have only sentences, therefore, that are grammatically complete. And very good example, I'm looking at Ryan here. Uh, continue installation of the software. Yes. That's something you would yes. write into a screen? I hate that. I don't like that. When I'm translating, I don't like it. Because it's not complete. It's, uh, it requires tone. In yeah. English, it's a Anybody sentence. Anybody ever written strings like that? Everybody does. When, I, I, yeah. when I'm it translating... It comes easy, right? Yeah. Okay. Ryan's so like, what's wrong with this? <laughs> no, we, we've clearly crossed over from talking about documentation to talking about UIs. And you can't have complete sentences everywhere in the UI. It just doesn't work. Well, but you can but have continued nice, installation right? of software, yes or no? Well, that's what I would do, right? Yeah, they use only sentences that are grammatically complete. I really this is not practical. This is the ideal world. Do you want to continue the software installation? You don't have enough space. I know that. Please don't take it easy. But if you have enough space, you probably want to use complete sentences. It's not about space, yeah. I think. It's about Oops. it's about the concentration. It's about the attention span of the, of, of the user. Somebody has to parse that sentence, the previous sentence. Yeah. It actually has elided the, the parts of the sentence that people don't need to know to respond immediately. Part of the other problem with translation is that uh, 
you're translating into your native language. So it's a non-native English speaker. Yeah. Uh, so they're struggling with this. They really, I like, I, I feel this. <laughs> well, a very easy solution to that is um, if um, the UI uh, programmer that the person writing the string fills in some information into uh, additional information, or how do you call that now, Brian? Do you have some field for additional information for each thing? Right? Well, there's two things you can do. There's context and comments. Okay. Uh, context is <coughs> write the whole sentence. So the translate actually knows what you wanted to say. It's yeah. probably more like the comments. Context okay, is like... Okay, so bang it into context. Comments. Context, yeah. Context should be something else. Mm. Let's see. Another thing that I have a problem with is like a sentence like that. Like I'm only taking this one example. But you could just say continue installation. Yes or no. Like. Yeah. You know, if we're talking about adding too much to being too verbal, like they're mm. obviously installing software. <laughs> so we don't obviously. need to ask them <laughs> that part, you know. So it's like just like little things like that where it's like people are afraid of making them too long, but they're including unnecessary information in the software. I actually that's already have there. a problem with the Wait, software. I mean, they're way. obviously installing, so it could just be continue. Continue, yes or no. Yeah. You could do that. Yeah. Now we are extremely minimalistic. I have a problem with the software already. I don't know what software I'm installing here. Like the one I've done, uh, the package I've done before, or the package I'm doing now, or, the, or is this already the next one? Mm, so it's just one specific right now. Yes, we're done. I beg your pardon. I want to just stop installing software at this point, actually. Okay. Which one? You never have yes or no. No. Ah. Just do it. Okay. Why no? Isn't that what you do when your app get installed? Well, that's a bad user. <laughs> you never want buttons to say yes or no. You want them to be like continue and stop. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm slowly getting over my error. I'm really mm -hmm. glad for that, for helping. You should be sure you're smiling like because uh, <laughs> he's not running out of talks. You said this is too long, but you said. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree. <laughs> Next time you will have yeah. Well, control sentence length, exactly. Uh, how can we do that? Uh, this is rule. Um, 25, or 25 is a lot. Informative sentences for instructive sentences, it should be 17 actually. Uh, or less if possible. What does it look like? Uh, writers will approach any writing project by collecting the required information first and after carefully analyzing, evaluating, and structuring it, they will create a first draft. Or we just break it up into information mm -hmm. chunks and we have a uh, very clear either writer performs a formal task. One, collecting the data, analyzing and evaluating data, writing the first part. So we are breaking this up and then we have that all together. <laughs> Next one, very important. You need to know what you're dealing for. First, you have to be able to identify each part of your sentence. And basically also the noun. Use an article to identify the noun. What do I mean by this? Let's have a look. Verify result or result verify? What do I mean? Verify the result. Problem fixed. Everybody knows what's going on here. So, and if you're interested in, have a look. Plain English is a very nice site. Uh, if you're interested in software and um, the simplified technical English standard, uh, ASD SDE 100 is the standard. The website is very informative and has links to software vendors. Uh, some easy technical writing guidelines can be found in TechPros. And if people are more interested in standards, I might have something on the hard drive. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll play some slides somewhere. Yeah, I know, but I'll forget, so I'm very short attention to Okay. Can you have a comment? Whose site is the techpros.com? 
Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was yours. Down somewhere. Okay. But uh, it's not bad. That's good. Okay. Any questions? Final questions? Yes, please. So, this is not a question about what, about how, how to write for translation, but it's sort of it's more of a social problem, a social process. Let's say I have a site. I have a wiki. I'm letting Joe Random from Kazakhstan translate into whatever they speak in Kazakhstan. Okay, yeah. um, and I have no way, I want my site to be technically accurate. I don't know, I don't read his language. I don't know how to uh, make sure that the information that he's giving people is an accurate translation of what I'm Quality what, control. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, that's Quality a very control. interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, the way GNOME, Fedora, and other bigger open source projects solve this problem is by putting together translation teams. Not sure. having one person, like <coughs> not having just Ari doing one translation sure. to Israeli uh, Hebrew, but having a group and they have peer reviews. And they have one team lead that checks everything, for example, on Gary, me, or Gabo. Gabo is very, very tough and he rejects everything that is not as qualitatively useful as he likes to. By that, he has only one translator in his team himself. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's very, very keen. But um, other teams are more open. So it, it really depends who is, who is in your team. And finally, those are volunteers. And if you do not allow for errors and for slip-ups, then you probably have to open the checkbook <coughs> and find one of the translators. Um, and uh, the and I mean, no, and I think most uh, open source projects are, are basically just it's just kind of a level of trust, right? You, you have people that come into your circle. Um, one thing that I, I know is used in um, by large corporations, not necessarily for software or documentation localization, but localization in general, when they don't, they might even be paying for it, they probably are paying for it, but they don't, they don't even trust someone even though they're paying them. Uh, if, if they're very serious about it, um, some places will use a uh, translation, reverse translation process, where you have two independent parties, so you mm. get, uh, you hire this person to translate into Czech, and then you go over to this, other party completely independent, and you pay them to translate that check back into English, mm. and then you can check that, you know, that English. English. You can check, wah, wah. check by checking the English. <laughs> so, so. Maybe that wasn't the best language uh, to I use for your example. I've never personally Here. seen this implemented in a um, open source or community volunteer uh -huh. uh, environment. I, I don't see that it couldn't be. But obviously, there's a lot of the process involved in it. So, because then you're supposed to be translating it to your native language, which is probably the best that you can like. Yes. So it occurs to me that maybe a social process for a volunteer thing. And may, I, I'm just maybe if okay. So obviously, you want to set up translation teams, right? That's ideal. Having multiple people checking in. In the instance where we haven't been able to do that, and we've only got one person translating into a, you know to whatever, a relatively obscure language, maybe just flagging it and saying, this has not yet been reviewed. Um, that is probably a very good idea. The second is the more this person is translating, the more, the more experience he has, the better he gets. Right. Maybe or getting that person to go back and look over his previous translations to see no. if he's, or I mean, either he's doing it himself or he's not. But if you mm. push a person, uh, they're not very happy. So if you actually show them that you distrust them, you might actually use them. No, no, no. Uh, I, well, I think there's other ways you can do it. Yeah. You should and tell them how much you appreciate their work. Mm. And by doing that, they feel that they're doing something useful and will try harder next time. Mm. Like the, I had this crazy example about the Hungarian translation team that uh, there's a person that just believes quality comes over quantity, and which is true, probably. But uh, by rejecting other translators, he rejects part of the community. 
Great. And I believe that translation, especially for open source communities, has a very, very important function in that it's not just translation, it is building communities. Mm. And translation team is the first point of contact to a project. And from there, you just build new teams that are interested in other stuff. And so I believe uh, the more people you have involved, the better. And sometimes the translations are no good, and that happens, and you have to let this out. Mm. Yeah. So one of the, or there's two poems that I've noticed in translation in, in Venoma and, and Ubuntu specifically. Uh, I think sometimes in some teams uh, in Gnome, uh, translators are more concerned about uh, quantity instead of quality. And uh, Ubuntu's Rosetta uh, allows a translator to go in and just translate one or two strings mm -hmm. uh, individually. So then uh, I've seen this where I pull a file, where I pull a file, and um, they just take all the easy ones. Yeah. Well, no, but I've pulled the entire file, and every like things are translated in so many different ways. Like we, for the specific example that I can think of is was a GNOME game, and the word puzzle was translated in two different ways. So half the time it was one word for puzzle and another word was another half the time. So and, and when you looked at it, it was different translators. So they just go in, do 10 strings and leave without actually looking at the entire file because mm. uh, Rosetta allows you to do that. You don't have to pull the file. You never have to pull the file. And um, I tend to pull the file. And I find like error, constant errors. Like I know that the Czech and the Slovak translation teams I know have uh, regular terminology this where they discuss actually exactly this problem like um, translating two different ways, um, deciding on what to call to a certain language. And that happens when you have well organized teams. Yeah. You have smaller like teams that. or teams that can't meet because um, they're living on different continents or living far away, then it becomes hard. But in small countries like well, like on Czech Republic, it's easy to meet up. And uh, that is a reason why Bardic should have more hackfests for translators, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Can you go back to the uh, second last slide? Third last slide? Can I? <laughs> there. Mike, uh, I can give you a copy of actually the last draft. Now I see that I didn't find the last draft. It has a lot of very embarrassing mistakes here. But what do you think of the simple language with you did? The simple language with you did. Simple English with you did. I know, I think much of it because I haven't seen it. It's basically like these concepts applied to the extreme to which you did. Oh, okay. I will simplify Wikipedia. Yes, uh, I'm not a fan of it because um, it very often isn't simplified English. And it really depends on the writer and uh, the writers do not use their own guidelines. Like a friend of mine did a uh, wiki page on technical writing and some Jerry came along and decided oh, this is far too complicated for English native speakers, so I will make a simplified page of it so that I will have a Wikiversity page too. And actually complicated stuff. And it has become very ambiguous because he didn't know what he was talking about. So I very often don't know what to say about this. Yeah. Um, I just want to say there's a, with regards to some style things, there's an application called XML Copy Editor, mm -hmm. uh, which has a, a feature that can show you if um, your, your text, it can check it for disability, disability, gender, um, diversity, religion, reputation. Other stuff I don't know about. Like, this sounds like a fantastic tool. Post-colonial. Yeah. Um, I don't know what these, all these kind of things are. Sensitivity, yeah. I thought that it uh, had like a reading scale. Like, well, 
What I use is a simple set shell script. And I just throw in all the terminology I want to avoid. And from time to time I just uh, check my, my shell script and that's it. But uh, yeah, anyway, this tool looks actually very interesting. I might have rented it. I'd like to. Good. Any other questions or are we already done? Well, if we are done, then nothing left but to thank you. And questions and helping me stretch my talk to another level.